Hello, can you hear me? I see one head. How about in the back? People in the back of the room hear me? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm Tom Devlin, and on behalf of the Short Course Committee of the American Statistical Association, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Las Vegas and to our annual short course program. This year, the Continuing Education Office is pleased to present two short courses on computer intensive methods. Today, <coughs> Brad Efren and Rob Tipshirani will introduce us to the bootstrap. And tomorrow, Jerome Friedman, Richard Olshin, and Charles Stone will discuss classification and regression trees. Most statistical methods in common use today rely on the assumption of normality and focus on statistical measures whose theoretical properties are mathematically tractable. Powerful high-speed com digital computers have stimulated the development of new statistical, analysis, statistical methods and theories which release researchers from these limitations. These methods are computational spendthrifts and so have been referred to as computer intensive. One class of such methods is the bootstrap. The bootstrap was invented less than 10 years ago by Bradley Efren. The purpose of this course is to provide you with a working knowledge of the bootstrap. To aid in this goal, we are fortunate to have as our instructors, Bradley Efren and Robert Tipsharani. Let me introduce you to them. Bradley Efren is professor of statistics and biostatistics at Stanford University, where he is currently chair of the program in mathematical sciences. He is a former editor of the theory and methods section of JASA, and he is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and a recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Award. The Wall Street Journal recently had a front page article on these awards. It was quite an interesting article, indicating that only 166 people have received such an, such an award, and, contain, and it contained interviews with a few recipients. One of those interviewed had an interesting comment about her fellow recipients. She said, these are not people who go to Las Vegas. <laughs> Robert Tipshirani is a postdoc fellow in the Department of Preventive Medicine and biostatistics at the University of Toronto. He's a recent PhD graduate of Stanford University, where his mentor was Bradley Efren. His research interests include the bootstrap and non-parametric regression techniques, in particular generalized additive models. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Efren. Okay, thank you. Well, that, that was supposed to establish that I have a sport coat, and uh, <laughs> that's why we're on. Uh, we actually have TV recording this for future use, and I wanted everyone to see that I indeed own a very nice sport coat, but I never wear it uh, for talks because uh, uh, it seems to me to stop uh, uh, necessary motions of uh, 
like, why don't you guys ask more questions? <laughs> and uh, that's an important point, um, which I'd like to bring up right at the beginning. Uh, we're going to be, a, this is not a one hour talk, we're going to be going for quite a while. And uh, it really is deadly if I and Rob drone on and on uh, with no change of voice and <laughs> uh, presenting material to you. Uh, the, uh, we've given this um, as a practice course uh, once or twice, and it really works a lot better if people will ask questions. Uh, most of the questions, uh, the bootstrap is not a complicated, it's not a technically complicated subject, so you won't be overwhelmed with technicalities. Uh, however, at a certain point, uh, and I've given lots of bootstrap talks, it always occurs to people, and to me too, uh, why are we doing this? And uh, can this possibly be right? And those kinds of questions are very helpful. Uh, if you ask a question, just raise your hand. I'll say, oh yes. And then just ask your question in a loud voice. I'll repeat the question to make sure that everyone can hear it. And then I'll maybe even try and answer the question. So uh, that's the way it'll go. Um, you have lots of stuff that we gave you. Uh, uh, you have copies of all our transparencies. Almost all, we added a couple at the last minute. Uh, but mostly you have the transparencies that you'll be seeing up there. And uh, that's so that you don't have to desperately take notes. Some people feel more, more comfortable taking notes than not. Uh, so please do if you feel like it. But basically you won't have to take any notes. You can just concentrate on uh, thinking up good questions. Uh, the, uh, you also have a report, a copy of a report called The Bootstrap Method of Assessing Statistical Accuracy. And that's by Rob and me. And it, as a modest goal of, of today's presentations, uh, you should at the end of the day be able to read the report rather easily. And the report has quite a bit more in it, of course, than we'll say, uh, and, and gets more into the technical details. Uh, this is not a good, f this kind of forum is not a good forum for getting in deeply into technical stuff, and we'll try and avoid it. Uh, there, of course, some of the things will be, um, I mean, it's not uh, English literature or something like that, but it will, there will be some <laughs> technical stuff. But um, the, the, Of course, the real point of going to something like this is not to learn any particular this or that, but to understand the point of view of a, of a different subject matter. And we, we very much hope that we'll get our point of view across to you. And uh, uh, the, uh, what we want to convince you is that this is a reasonable theory and is, in fact, a, th a theory that y you as applied statisticians or theoretical statisticians know already, but in a different guise. And uh, what, what it really is is a a version of, uh, of the theory that we all use for estimation and setting standard errors brought up to date for the computer age. Okay, so uh, that's about it for getting going. Are there any questions about the rules? We'll go for about an hour or so now, and then take a break, there'll be some coffee, then uh, Rob will be up. Oh yeah, we're doing this the way uh, Police always have uh, interrogate people in, in two two person teams, a, a good guy and a bad guy, and the good guy the bad guy comes in and says something terrible, I'm going to break your arm off or something like that, and then the good guy comes in and says, let me save you from the bad guy, confess, and Rob's the good guy. Um, I, I'll be giving the more basic <laughs> theoretical stuff, uh, of, of which it's not very theoretical, and then Rob will come in and say how this is applied. In real, real problems, and real problems means complicated real problems. So uh, we hope that the subject matter of the examples will be of genuine interest to you also. Okay, so let's go. The next slide, please. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. Well, we can leave that up here. Uh, there's, uh, besides the, uh, besides the uh, material uh, that I mentioned, there's one extra handout. You actually got two separate pages uh, that had a lot of, of uh, numbers on them. Those were things that didn't show up very well when they got reproduced in the, in the handouts. And, and they're, they're, the, they're the numbers that, that are just computer output. For example, the first one says on the top, bootstrap methods, 
Ep Efren and Tipsharani, 8385. Now everybody should try and find that piece of paper. It'll be on a slide too, but you won't be able to read it on the slide, so uh, I wanted you to have that piece of paper. Is there anybody? Okay, we'll wait a minute or two. So it says bootstrap methods, Efren and Tipsharani, 8385, and it says at the top, n equals 15 observed lifetimes. That's going to be it. Let me put that one over here for a second, and then we'll get back to it. It'll be on the main one soon. Say, and it's not, it's not really readable. OK, is there anybody who has not found that piece of paper? Did you? Well, I have a suggestion. Let's go to the door behind the screen. Um, uh, the, uh, perhaps we can get the people from behind the screen to quit. Uh, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, I had the terrible fear that the door was already closed. <laughs> Okay, fine. Meanwhile, I'll handle the I'll handle the slides until it's, okay. it's being taken care. Okay, so here we are in Las Vegas. La last night, uh, uh, as we were wandering around, Rob said to me, "Here we are in a an entire city built on the strong law of large numbers." <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a very good comment. Okay. So let's start. Here we are in a typical situation. Incidentally, I work in a biostatistics group. And uh, uh, so most of this theory, and indeed the bootstrap, was generated by uh, the need for certain kinds of data analytic tools. Uh, so here we are in the typical situation in the uh, stat lab. Uh, we have some data. And I've called the data Y. Uh, and uh, that just stands for generic data. Uh, y has, uh, in particular, uh, this morning we'll be talking about the, the situation where Y consists of independent repeated observations, a random sample. So uh, uh, in, I wrote down, for example, uh, Y equals X1 through X15, a random sample of 15 lifetimes. And uh, here on the, the sheet of paper that I said you wouldn't be able to see, uh, here's the n equals 15 lifetimes. They're right at the top of the piece of paper. And we'll, I'll put that back over here in a minute. Um, the, uh, the uh, I've, or I've ordered the 15 lifetimes. So the smallest one is uh, 0.143, and the next one is 0.182, and the biggest one is 2.076. They're all positive because they're lifetimes. They don't, they don't look very normal. They look like they're sort of stretching out to the right. Is everybody? Is anybody not able to see where I'm reading the 15 observed lifetimes? OK. And uh, typically, we'll have a parameter of interest theta that we're interested in knowing. Uh, for example, the true expected lifetime of any one of the typical observations. And uh, we'll want to estimate theta from y. So that's, that's a pretty basic statistical operation. And I'm sure that all of you have been in that situation, or you wouldn't be here. Next, please. OK. And then two basic questions arise. The two basic questions are, question one, what statistic theta hat of y should we use to estimate theta? Uh, question two, how accurate is theta hat as an estimate of theta? So let me repeat the two questions, because we're going to come back to these a lot today. The first question, which you might say is the primary statistical question, is how should we estimate what we're interested in? How should we use the data to get a number that says something about what we're interested in? The second question, which is the main one we're going to address today, is how accurate is theta hat? Having chosen theta hat at the first step, how accurate is it as an estimate of theta? And it's our existence as a field depends on the fact that we can answer that question. Mo most good scientists can answer the first question rather well without any statistical training. Eh, that's not exactly true. And of course, we've had a lot to say about how to answer the first question. But typically, when doctors or medical researchers come in and talk to me, they actually usually have a fairly good idea of how to answer question one. What 
question two not only is hard to answer, it doesn't even occur to most <laughs> non-statisticians. <laughs> and, and yet it's fundamental in some sense to the use of uh, your answer to question one. Uh, very good scientists, people who are trained very well, uh, people as good as Linus Pauling, if they do not have statistical training, are, are hopeless at answering question two in any reasonable way. And we're going to be talking about how to answer question two. Next slide, please. Okay. This is to remind you that uh, back in the 1920s, a very successful program uh, was begun by R.A. Fisher to answer both questions. And it's, uh, I, I believe, the single most successful enterprise in the history of both theoretical and applied statistics is uh, this program that Fisher developed in just an amazing series of papers that spanned uh, about 1920 through 1935. Um, and the, uh, the uh, Fisher's program answered both questions in a, in a most elegant way. The answer to question one was use theta hat of y the MLE. That is, if you want to answer question one, what statistic to use, you don't have to worry, just use the MLE maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, the answer to, that is the answer to question two, is the, how accurate is the MLE, was that the standard error of the MLE theta hat is approximately sigma hat equals one over the square root of the Fisher information. And I'm sure you've all done those calculations where you differentiate log likelihoods maybe once or twice and take square roots and plug in. And you, 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 a lot of the answers have become so familiar to us that you, don't, you forget that that's how they're derived. Uh, that is, you may know the answer already from, from the fact that other people have derived it and written it down in books. But in fact, uh, an awful lot of, uh, of statistical theory depends on, on uh, these two answers. Next, please. The, the bootstrap is a more general way to answer question two. And it, uh, uh, it involves less parametric modeling than Fisher's theory. Uh, Fisher's theory is built around, uh, always around a, a parametric model, a simple parametric model usually, for the, uh, for the data in terms of unknown parameters. And that's, that's a fundamental characteristic of, of it that we'll talk more about. Uh, the bootstrap is not necessarily based on parametric modeling. It can be used in parametric settings, and we'll talk about that. It can also be used in non-parametric settings, and that's, it was originally introduced to be a non-parametric device, because it's in the non-parametric settings that Fisher's theory is least satisfactory and least easy to apply. And, and I must, uh, I'll remind you later on that this, the bootstrap was not the first attempt to go beyond uh, Fisher's theory there, uh, in particular the jackknife, which we'll also talk about a little, was a, uh, a very successful and interesting attempt to uh, answer question two for non-parametric situations. The bootstrap also works for less smooth statistics. I didn't say that this, but it, the answer to question two uh, uh, for Fisher's theory involves uh, smoothness assumptions. Uh, you should be able to differentiate the uh, statistics um, the likelihood functions nicely and all that stuff. And uh, the, uh, it breaks down for statistics like the median, which aren't very smooth at all. And um, we'll, we'll talk more about that also. So that's the payoff. The price is a lot more computation. Fisher's theory is extremely elegant. And uh, uh, it requires the minimum amount of computation. Well, I, that, actually, the right way to say it is it involves the maximum amount of computation you can do on a desk calculator because that is exactly the way Fisher uh, designed the theory. He, the desk calculator was a gigantic step forward uh, from hand calculation and enabled a theory like Fisher's theory to be, uh, to be practical. It really wasn't practical without a desk calculator. And he, at many points, wrote down that uh, uh, that uh, he wouldn't have invented, say, analysis of variance, which is another part of his theory, if, there, if it hadn't been for the existence of the desk calculator. Um, and I remember when I started at Stanford, uh, our computation room had Monroe calculators and Frieden calculators, and you sort of decided which one you wanted to use depending on 
what noise level you could stand because uh, they, uh, they, they were really like a truck. Uh, but boy, you were glad to get, get your hands on one because it was sure a lot better than trying to, uh, trying to do multiplications and divisions by hand. Um, I went and looked up in the, uh, I have a set of uh, 1930 Encyclopedia Britannica that somebody gave me. And I like to look up things in them. Uh, I went up, uh, I looked in uh, under computation. And the, uh, uh, you have to remember that the Britannica at this stage was the uh, supreme arbiter of uh, encyclopedias and presumably had articles written by the best people in the world. And uh, the, uh, the guy who wrote on computation was not sanguine about the possibility of a mechanical device that actually did uh, division. Though he thought that a German device that was based on steel balls rolling back and forth had some promise. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, like, I like reading these things because, first of all, if the 1930 encyclopedia is that wrong, I have a feeling the 1985 one is not much better. We just don't know it yet. And um, it is a reminder that computation has come a long way. The bootstrap requires perhaps 100 or 1,000 times more computation than uh, Fisher's theory did. And we'll talk about those numbers also. But uh, this is quite a bargain. Uh, because the uh, electronic computers that we now have are perhaps a million times faster and cheaper than those desk cal calculators. And cheap, cheaper means it doesn't cost a lot to run. If they were a million times faster, but it cost a million times more, that, that wouldn't help any either. Uh, they really are, uh, they really have improved our computational environment by a factor of a million. And uh, that's uh, incidentally a bigger factor than uh, the step in going from naked eye astronomy to telescopy. So one can expect that statistics is in for a golden age of, uh, of advance and that uh, lots of theories like bootstrap and like the theory you'll hear about tomorrow um, will be developed in response to all this power. Um, there, the, last, the first point is, uh, the first two points are differences between the two theories. The third point though that um, both theories are completely automatic. That is, that's a similarity. Both theories um, uh, go directly. You can actually build a black box that goes, that would look something like this. Let's see if this works. Here's the black box. And here's data and here's say the parametric the form of the density function let's call it f sub theta the form of the density function and here's the answer I won't use the board much uh, the um, that is it is possible to write an algorithm for Fisher's method, say, that will input the data, the probabilistic model, and output the answer with absolutely no further cleverness re required of the statistician. That it's done once and for all. All the cleverness went into designing the, the idea, and after that it's packaged. And you do not have to do it anymore. You don't have to think anymore. And, uh, uh, the bootstrap is the same way. It's, a, it's what I call an automatic theory. Um, and a, an example of a non-automatic theory that you may be familiar with is the theory of uh, minimum variance unbiased estimation, which you, most of you have probably learned about. And that is not an automatic theory. For each new problem, you have to cleverly try and figure out whether or not you can find a UMVU estimate uh, in that case or not. If, if that wasn't, if, if the minimum variance unbiased theory was automatic, I guarantee you it would have replaced maximum likelihood estimation as the dominant practical estimation technique. It is not automatic. Automatic theories are very important for me when I'm working in a day-to-day -day mode uh, uh, trying to get somebody an answer. I don't want to have to be clever every time a new problem comes in. Uh, it's, it's, it's too much of a strain on my aging brain and I, I really want to give them an answer in an automatic, quick way that I can be fairly certain is, is close to optimal. And that's just what both of these theories do. Next, please. Talk about 
the simplest possible case first. And uh, this really doesn't work very well. Um, simplest possible case is a sample mean. And it's, um, it's one that we'll, we'll use to motivate the general theory. Uh, so it, we might have uh, decided to answer the question about, remember the 15 observed lifetimes. And question one was, um, oh, we, we were supposed to have a parameter of interest theta. And um, we wanted to estimate it. And question one was, how should we estimate it? And let's just say that we've answered question one with the traditional answer. We'll, esti we'll estimate the expected lifetime with the sample expectation. That is the sample mean. And uh, x bar, that is just the uh, sum of the n observations. I cannot stop using n. n is 15 here. <laughs> anyway, there it is. Uh, summation xi from 1 to n divided by n. And if you look on that separate sheet of paper, it says uh, uh, someplace that the mean is 0.804. It's even in a little box. Does anybody not see where it says mean equals 0.804? Please tell me if you do not see. I, my feelings will not be hurt. I'll point it out to people. OK. And uh, what's, um, what's special? OK, so, how ac so now let's get on to question two. How accurate is the sample mean for estimating the true mean? We, we know perfectly well that the true mean of the population is not exactly 0.804. Um, well, uh, there's a simple formula for the standard error that everybody learned in their first statistics class. And the simple formula uh, expresses the standard error of x bar. I've written that there is sigma of f n x bar with x bar in quotes. And let me say why I've written it that way. Sigma stands for standard error and will all today. Uh, f is the unknown sampling distribution from which we are drawing the x's. And I'll t say a little more about that in a second. n is the sample size. We know that. 15. X bar in quotes is the way of forming the statistic. I put it in quotes because it's not the, the number that we got, 0.804. It's the way we took a set of numbers and condensed them into one number. And uh, that we know also. So we don't need to put n and x bar in our notation because we know n and x and quotes x bar. We know, that, we know that we're using sample size n and we know that we're using the um, sample mean. Uh, so I just called it sigma of f there. And the, uh, so sigma of f is the standard error when sampling 15 times, standard error of the mean when sampling 15 times from um, uh, unknown population f and forming the sample mean. And what we happen to know is that um, the, uh, that standard error has a nice formula. And the nice formula is written the next line there. It's the second central moment of f divided by n to the 1 half power. And this is a really, it really is a simple formula. And uh, uh, everybody learned it a long time ago. But the fact that it's a simple formula should not conceal from you that it's a very wonderful formula. It's, uh, it's, it's actually an integration over n-dimensional space done very cleverly. And uh, uh, when people realized this, this was an important step forward in early statistics. Uh, the second central moment, incidentally, uh, if I was, uh, let me write it. The second central moment is the, uh, the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value. It's the second moment around the mean, just for those who want to be reminded. Uh, what's a random sample? Uh, a random sample, well, we have a true distribution f. And I've drawn a little picture there of f yielding x1 through xn by random sampling, uh, by which I always picture the population f being written out in lots of slips of paper. 
Um, as a matter of fact, an infinite number of pieces of paper, because I like to think of infinite populations so we don't have to worry about finite population difficulties. Put in a hat and very well mixed and n draws, in this case 15 draws made from, from it. It's what you might call uh, uh, in an IID sample, an independent identically distributed sample, a random sample. It, every, the x's are independent, they all have the same distribution, and then that distribution is f. Yes? Yes, uh, in this case, sig sigma is not, the, the question was, uh, the question was, uh, is, is, does, doesn't sigma apply to theta, or theta hat? Is it, it, yes, yes, thank you for asking, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, ma for making that point. I always use the term standard error for the standard deviation of a statistic of interest to make the distinction between that and say the standard deviation of any one of the individual XIs. So yes, sigma uh, is the standard deviation of what I called theta hat at first, not the standard deviation of one of the Xs. Does that, does that answer the point? Thank you for asking that, because that, that's a typical point that, that the difficulty with giving talks on things you know or have given too many talks on is that you always forget the important points, and uh, uh, that's one of them. St the, the stan it's the standard error of the estimator or of the estimate of interest, not of one of the individual components, and that's what we're trying to estimate, because that, that's the thing that gives us an answer, or at least a partial answer, to question two. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Okay. Um, okay, we have the next slide, please. Uh, so we seem to have a nice formula for the standard error. The one trouble with the formula is it involves something unknown. It involves uh, the second central moment of F, so we don't seem to be any further ahead than we were before because we don't know that. However, it's quite easy to estimate the second central moment of F, and that's what's usually done. And in your elementary statistics class long, long ago, uh, longer ago for some than for others, uh, the, uh, uh, you probably use the unbiased estimate of, sig of the second central moment, u2 bar, which is the summation of xi minus x bar squared divided by n minus 1. And I bet, I bet they made a lot of fuss about dividing by n minus 1 instead of dividing by n, because that's the thing that makes the estimate unbiased. Um, and then you just plug that into the formula for mu2, uh, for, for sigma of f, for the unknown standard error, and you get the usual estimate of, uh, of, uh, of you, you get the usual estimated standard error for the mean, which is the second central moment of the, the estimated second central moment of the sample, mu2 bar divided by n to the one half power. And if I were to write that out, it would come out summation xi minus x bar squared divided by n minus 1, and then divided again by n to the 1 half power. And that's a formula I, I bet every one of you has used many times. Um, there's an easier way to get to, to substitute into the formula for sigma of f. And let me describe the easier way by the easier way, or the one that would have occurred, I think, to most of us first, if we were faced with this problem, say, a couple hundred years ago, is why not, instead of S, we don't know F, but we happen to know F hat. What's F hat? F hat is the empirical distribution of the data, the distribution that puts mass 1 over n on each of the n points. And uh, that's, if you just draw the points on the line and, and make equal size dots at each of the points, in a sense, you're, you're thinking of f hat. In our, in our particular case, you'd put mass 1 15th at 0.143, mass 1 15th at 0.182, dot, 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 mass, by mass I mean probability, 1 15th at 2.076. And that would be the empirical distribution. We could, why not, here's an idea, we have a formula sigma of f for the standard error of the, of the sample mean no matter what f is. We don't know what f is, why not substitute f for f hat for f? That's a simple idea, and I've done that. Uh, you get almost the same answer as above. 
what, what's the difference? There's one difference between, the, between this answer and the answer above. The, yes, the, the, uh, the divisor is n instead of n minus 1. You get the maximum likelihood estimate instead of the unbiased estimate. So if you now plug that in, sigma of f hat is almost the same as, that's what I'll call sigma of hat, and that's almost the same as what I call sigma bar above the usual estimate, except in the denominator, there'll be, instead of n minus 1 times n, there'll be n times n. And uh, that's, that's not a big difference, of course. It's not of, of practical. There's no theoretical reason for preferring one to the other. And as a matter of fact, you can make arguments both ways. You can make arguments that's good to divide by n plus 1, for example, a decision theoretic kind of argument. Uh, let me point out that the, the second, I, I said it's easier. The reason I said it's easier is that it's conceptually easier. What, in the first, the first step, was a very simple decision theoretic kind of argument. The, that is the first way we did it, where we used mu2 bar. We actually thought about what was going into the formula and tried to get a good estimate of something in the formula. Uh, well, that's, that's not automatic. If we have to think each time about what's a good estimate, the, the problems are going to get a lot more complicated. That's, that's a clever, and in today, clever will be a word with negative connotations. Uh, that's a clever way to do the problem. Just substituting f hat for f has nothing special to do with this problem, and in that sense, it's conceptually easier. So, on to the next slide. Uh, incidentally, that sigma hat is the bootstrap estimate of standard error for the mean. Big deal, huh? Um, why don't we just always substitute f hat for f anytime we have a problem, and uh, uh, in sigma of f. Uh, well, the fly in the ointment is that for more complicated statistics, uh, there is no formula for sigma of f. And if, if you think back to that course that I keep referring to, you'll remember that somehow there weren't any other formulas like that, li uh, like the one for the mean. There wasn't, you didn't get a formula for the standard error of the median, uh, the sample median. And the reason is there is no formula. Uh, there's approximate formulas. And if you take more advanced courses, you start learning more and more approximations, formulas for standard errors for more and more complicated statistics. But basically, there is no simple expression like the one we had before. So for example, uh, here's, here's some examples we'll follow through. The sample median um, for the 15, um, for the 15 uh, Lifetimes, the sample median was uh, 0.611. And that's on your handout also. It says median equals 0.611. It's in a little box up near the top. The 10% trim mean was 0.734. 10% trim mean means you take, in this case, one and a half observations off of each end. And I won't say what taking a half of an observation off, but it's sort of obvious. And then you take the, the mean of the, of the middle 12 in this case the remaining 80% uh, of the data. Uh, that was 0.734. We would like to know the standard errors of those uh, estimates also. However, there is no simple formula for the standard error. There's no formula for sigma f n quotes theta hat, where theta hat is a statistic, say, like the sample median. Again, I'll just always call that sigma of f. So we can't substitute f hat for f. The bootstrap. What the bootstrap is, is a numerical algorithm for always finding the numerical value of sigma hat, the bootstrap estimate, which is sigma of f hat. It's just the formula, if we had the formula, sigma of f with f hat substituted for f. But you don't have to know the formula to do it. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you any analytic results. What it gives you is the number that you would get. And that's what the bootstrap is. Good time to interrupt me, stop me here if I've. Ah, why is it called the bootstrap? Uh, that's a good question. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, originally I, I wasn't going to call it the bootstrap. I was going to call it the combination distribution for reasons I'll tell you. And I was really glad I didn't because uh, it's called the bootstrap because in the original paper I was writing about the jackknife. And I wanted something that didn't sound any more technical than the jackknife. So uh, uh, 
uh, I blame Tukey for the name. Uh, uh, the, there's a serious reason why it's called the bootstrap, and that is it, uh, uh, as you'll see, it involves reusing the data in a certain way that seems to be pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's an old story from Germany, I think, of Baron Munchausen pulling himself out of the mud by lifting himself up by his own bootstraps, which, of course, is impossible. And in, in fact, uh, uh, the, for a long time, uh, a bootstrap machine was the definition of an impossible physical device. But uh, uh, in, in, it's gotten, I hope, more positive connotations. Uh, here, here it's a device that, uh, that is indeed a self-help kind of thing. And, and you'll see uh, that we reuse the data. OK, uh, to explain how the bootstrap algorithm works, and now it'll become clear why, why we call it the bootstrap, uh, I have to define what I mean by a bootstrap sample. Can I, can I? And a bootstrap sample will always, you'll know we're dealing with bootstrap stuff because there's always going to be a star up on the top. And the star, which didn't come out awfully well when drawn with a fat pen, uh, uh, indicates that uh, uh, actually this is not going to be real data. It's going to be data generated from a computer or a random number de device. Uh, and that's where the randomness is going to come from. Uh, a bootstrap sample y star equals x1 star through xn star is a random sample of size n drawn from f hat. And I crossed out with replacement when Rob pointed out to me that random sample meant uh, with replacement. That is, a random sample, in my opinion, in my definition, in our definition here today, is we assume the sample is infinite. So even though f, f hat is a distribution that only has n points, support points, we still think of it as an infinite population. And we draw n times from that. It's equivalent to say that we've drawn a sample of size n with replacement from the original set of numbers x1 through xn. So for example, we might get, if we, you, you, you can think of writing the numbers x1 through xn, like the 15 lifetimes, you can think of writing them each of them a million times and putting them all in a hat. So you have 15 million slips of paper in the hat, mixing it up real well, and drawing a sample of size 15 from that. That would be a bootstrap sample. Yes? Is the uh, bootstrap sample size always equal to the original sample size? Yeah. So why always choose that one? Yes. Uh, now, the question is, is the, why do we choose the bootstrap sample size to be the same as the original sample size? And that, that's a question that is asked of me very often, and the, the answer is, is simple. Remember, it's sigma of f n theta hat that we're trying to estimate. And I've suppressed n and theta hat from the notation, but we use the same statistical form, theta hat. We also use the same n. If we try and use a different size, biases will be introduced that have to be corrected later. That is, we will not estimate sigma of f hat. Um, it, sometimes it, it's conceivable that that might be a useful technique and then to recorrect later on. But in fact, uh, for, uh, I've never found any advantage to using any sample size except n. So the, the answer to the question is why is n in the bootstrap the same as n as before is that we're trying to mimic the real situation as closely as possible in order to get sigma of f hat. We want to get sigma of f hat is really sigma of f hat n theta hat. Thank you. Another good question. OK. Um, next slide, please. So that's what a bootstrap sample is. And here's how the bootstrap algorithm works. Um, step, it's a three-step algorithm. And I, I'm, I'm never any good. I can't use the new algorithmic notation. There's neat ways to write these things. And Rob's real good at them. But I can't ever write them right. Uh, so I just write my algorithms out in line, and I don't have it written right. Uh, but anyway, I think it'll be clear. Independently draw capital B bootstrap samples. Capital B is going to be a number like 100 or 1,000. And we'll talk about how big it has to be. Let's say it's 100 right now. OK. Yes. Question. Yes, let me say that this, uh, the question is, are these subsets of the original samples we're drawing? Each, each bootstrap sample, let's look at y star 1. 
Y star 1 is a vector. It has n objects in it, x1 star, x2 star, xn star. These n objects were gotten by drawing with replacement from f hat, which is to say that we put the numbers, we took the set of original values x1 through xn and drew n times with replacement. Mem I'm not saying without replacement, I'm saying with replacement. And so, for example, the first number might have shown up three times in the bootstrap sample. The second number might not have shown up at all. The third one might have shown up once, et cetera. OK, having done that once, that gives us y star 1. Now we start the whole thing again. We get y star 2. Finally, we get y star capital B. So we'll, we'll have drawn b times n little n times. So if, in, if, if, I, if b is 100 and n is 15, there'll have been a total of 1,500 draws to construct those. 100 samples. And these are, here we are answering your question. That's why it's called the bootstrap. We're using the data again. Yes? The question is, is, is there a limit to how big B can be? As a matter of fact, there's, there's a theoretical limit of how many different bootstrap samples there are. Uh, with n equals 15, there's actually 76 million, about 76.2 million different bootstrap samples possible. They're all the combinations of 15 things taken from a set of 15. Uh, but we don't want to do 76.2 million, even, even with a modern computer. That's going to take a little too long. Uh, so that's why we're doing random sampling. Yeah, but if we're, if we're small, obviously. You, you can start getting the same. Some of the Y star Bs might be the same. That won't affect things. But it, it, in fact, I have never gotten the same bootstrap sample. I always work with samples of size 10 or something like that or in my examples. And I've never, ever gotten a duplicate bootstrap sample that I know. Now, I might have because I haven't looked at the data, the, uh, the output carefully enough sometimes. It doesn't affect the theory, though, that we might get the same one. These are good questions today. Um, OK, for each, for each bootstrap sample, we can reevaluate the statistic of interest. For example, let's, let's concentrate on the sample median. We could reevaluate re the sample median again and again. Uh, so for y star 1, we could get the sample median. For y star 2, we could get the sample median. And we'll call those the bootstrap medians or the bootstrap re replications of the statistic in general. So now we have, say, 100 bootstrapped replications of our original statistic. And then we, we simply calculate the, the empirical standard deviation of those numbers, of those 100 numbers, or capital B numbers. That is, we take the average of uh, the theta hat stars. And there it is. I've called it theta hat star dot, just to indicate that we took the average of the B numbers. And then we form the, the root mean square sum of errors. And I've, and I've divided by b minus 1 instead of b just to be consonant with the usual literature. It wouldn't make any difference. That's a number I call sigma hat sub b. It's not quite the same as the number I called sigma hat, which is sigma of f hat. What would make it the same as sigma of f hat? If I, if I let b be infinity. If I let capital B be infinity, or actually, in, in, if I was clever, if I let it be 76.2 million and took them all carefully, uh, not by random sampling, then I could actually get uh, sigma hat infinity. Of course, that which would be sigma of f hat. We won't do that because that takes too long. Instead, we're going to be stuck with something like sigma hat sub 100, which means a bootstrap estimate based on 100 bootstrap replications. And it'll turn out that's fine. We'll do some calculations to show that. Um, can we have the next page, please? I've simplified. The algorithm looked messy on the previous page. In fact, it's really quite simple. And I've written it down a little more simply here. Uh, f hat gives y star b by random sampling. Y, y star b gives theta hat star b by reevaluating the statistic. And then the reevaluated values give uh, sigma hat of b by the usual formation of a standard sample standard error. And that's all there is to it. Uh, let's, let's look back at um, um, oh, uh, the next slide, please. 
Okay. As, as capital B goes to infinity, then sigma hat of B goes to sigma hat, the ideal bootstrap estimate of sigma, uh, which is sigma of f hat, which is sigma of f hat and theta hat. And there's dangers in boiling down the notation as much as I did to say sigma hat. It's, it's, there's a danger of losing track of what you estimated and what you knew. But in fact, all we did is we knew n, we knew th the form theta hat. All we did was substitute f for a, f hat for f, and that's sigma hat. Except we couldn't really get that, so we approximated that by Monte Carlo, and that's the actual bootstrap estimate that you usually have to use, sigma hat sub b, at least in a non-parametric situation. Um, if you look at, uh, if you go back and look at the um, uh, the handout that said bootstrap methods Efren and Tipsharani. I've actually gone through this for the median. And let, let, me, let me put this back over here for a minute. The, um, um, near the bottom of that page, it's, I, I've shown you the first 10 bootstrap samples for, um, well, they're the first 10 bootstrap samples. Uh, I, I forgot to say this. It doesn't matter what statistic you're going to evaluate. The, the bootstrap samples are always the same. It's what statistic you evaluate over them that's different. That's handy because that means you can write a computer algorithm that's very general for getting, getting the answers. Um, and the, let, let's look at the second bootstrap sample. Do you see down at the bottom? I've, I've outlined where it says the second bootstrap sample. Does anybody not see where, I sa where it says the second bootstrap sample? Because it's fun. I've ordered them. I've reordered the numbers. Of course, they didn't come out in proper order when I did random sampling. Uh, but I reordered them so they're easier to look at. And as a matter of fact, the first, the smallest of the original lifetimes appears once in the sample. 0.143 appeared once in the second bootstrap sample. 0.182 uh, did not appear. Well, that happens. <laughs> matter of fact, it happens about 32% uh, of the time that a number will not appear. Uh, you can figure out what the probability is later if you're in the mood to do that. Uh, neither the 0 0.2456 or 0 0.260 or point, oh yeah, 0 0.270 did appear. That's the uh, fifth one. Uh, 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.437 appeared. 0 0.509 did not appear. 611 did appear. Oh, excuse me, yeah. Uh, 0 0.611 did appear. 0 0.712 appeared four times. Not, not an unlikely event at all. You can figure that out. Uh, Etc. And there, of course, we got sample size 15. That's a bootstrap sample. And uh, I, I've explicitly written out the first 10 of them here, just because it's it's sort of fun to look at them and see what they see what they look like. And also, in the case of the sample median, it's very easy to evaluate the statistic once you have the ordered data, because the statistic is always just the eighth largest. That that's unusual for the me the median is an unusual statistic in that it's very easy to evaluate from the sample. Uh, so, uh, so in this case, theta hat star was 0.712. It wasn't 0.611, which is the median for the original data. That's why I didn't look at the first bootstrap sample. It happened to come out to be the same as the original data point, so that wouldn't have been much fun. Uh, the median is unusual in that the bootstrap median also always has to be one of the original data values. It could be the smallest data value, right? We could have gotten 0.143. What would it take for, uh, in order to get 0.143? What would have had to happen? Yes, the, we, we would have had to get eight or more observations on 0.143 for that to be the bootstrap median. That doesn't happen very often, as you can figure out. Never happened in the, I actually did 100 of them, and it never happened. OK, um, we did this 100 times. And up at the top, again, it says uh, bootstrap, uh, the bootstrap sigma hat, sigma hat 100 equal 0.229. I did it for the mean also, and it came out 0.156. That's up near the top of the handout. There's the, there's the uh, bootstrap sigma hat is 0.156. Uh, for the median, it came out 0.229. Uh, oh, in case you think taking medians always reduces standard errors for distributions that look like they have a long tail. Uh, it certainly doesn't for this 
this case, in fact, you've increased the standard error quite a bit. Um, sigma, uh, and both of those are based on 100. For the, for the mean, if you'll remember, we happen to know sigma hat infinity. It's just what I called sigma hat before because there's a close, there's a simple formula. That number is actually 0.155 here. So you can see we're pretty close. For the median, we do not have the simple formula, so we do not know what sigma hat infinity is. However, in the middle, I've traced what happened to the bootstrap median as we went along, at, 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 as b got bigger. Uh, what, what happened to the sigma hat for the median as b got bigger? At, at, for b equals 25, it was 0.23. For b equals 50, it was a 0.22. For b equals 100, it was 0.23. That is actually 0.229. I gave you more digits above. At, when we got up to 1,000, it was 0.25. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's pretty well settled down by then. So you can see that 100 is not a bad number to use here. Question? <coughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, I do, and it's coming up. I, uh, the question was, do I, have, uh, do I actually know what F was in this case? Is it real data or is it simulated data? It's simulated data. Uh, and the reason was that I wanted to be able to tell you what the correct answer was here. But I didn't want to tell you too early, because if I tell you too early, as soon as I say what the distribution is that it was drawn from, everybody will say, well, why didn't you use the right answer <laughs> for that one? And the answer, and, and even if you don't say it, you'll think it, because it's impossible. Not, we're, we're trained to think that way. To, you know, well, if you know that, say, the distribution is a one-sided Pareto, why didn't you use the optimum answer there? Well, we don't, in, in real problems, you don't know what distribution, most times, you do not know. Question. Suppose the original 15 observations were serially correlated. That example will be the subject of what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Yes, question. The, the question is, I, I, I said that as b goes to infinity, you actually get to sigma hat, which is sigma of f hat. That's, that's, a, that's a function of the strong law of large numbers, and we could prove that easily. Uh, how quickly it happens is a matter of error analysis. And later on today, I'll show you uh, the error analysis to show you how quickly you get there. In fact, it always turns out, because of the simple nature of the bootstrap, you can say that in most cases, you'll get there rather quickly. It's, it te it's ten uh, oh, and the other question is, does it depend on n? It, it depends more on the form of the, of the statistics. Statistics that tend to produce straggly outliers, which are very sensitive statistics, very non-robust statistics, it tends to take larger values of b. Though, in fact, it, then you don't have to use the usual formula for calculating sigma hat. You can instead try and use a formula that's more robust to calculate sigma hat b and get around that problem. In fact, a fairly safe general statement is b equals 100 is almost always enough for most standard error calculations. Regardless of n, regardless of, n, regardless of the form of the statistic. If you're just a little cautious about how you, uh, how you estimate sigma hat, you, if you don't blindly plug into the formula summation theta hat star b minus theta hat star dot squared, et cetera, it, it really is a good idea to plot the histogram of the theta hat star values, the bootstrap histogram, and actually look at it. And to see, because if there's one of them that's far away, you don't want to really include that in the, in the formula for the variance near the middle. Um, way in the back, the red, red. Sure. 